Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Gaines. Hello, and welcome to Chris Gaines, the podcast, the show where we take an exhaustive look at the career of country superstar Garth Brooks and his much maligned decision in 1999 to take on a nom de plume by the name of Chris Gaines. The album, In the Life of Chris Gaines, was meant to be a pre-soundtrack release to a feature film entitled The Lamb. It was a way of letting the audience get to know the character before they went to see the movie. Despite selling 2 million copies, the album was considered a complete failure and heralded an early retirement from Brooks. I'm Michael Eads. I'm Ashley Spurgeon. And this is Chris Gaines, the podcast, episode three. Yes. Yeah, we're doing it. So I wanted to start the show off with a little housekeeping. Uh, let everyone know that the show is brought to you by We Own This Town. You can check that out at weownthistown.net. We are on the Twitter, at mm-hmm. Garth Gaines SNL. That's where you can find us tweeting about the show, tweeting about random occurrences of Chris Gaines, things we Dozens discover. Dozens of gifts. Uh, yeah, hundreds, I think, of really? gifts. Yeah. And also, our official website, get this chrisgainespodcast.com last episode it was chrisgains.show which, oh. which was banned by facebook now we're chrisgainespodcast.com not banned by facebook how exciting yeah yes yeah we just move domains take that facebook share us on the internet put it on your wall <laughs> give it to your grandma <laughs> share it with your great aunt Alice, mm, yeah, who Alice is a loves, huge Garth fan. She loves Garth. Huge, and Chris. huge CG fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also want to take a moment to thank everyone who's been sending us feedback. We've been getting tweets, Instagram DMs from face- all over the world. Yeah, literally from all over the world. It's a phenomenon. It's amazing. We're we're really doing it. We're doing it. We're this making is it. a difference. We're helping. <laughs> I want, that's all I've ever wanted to do is help. Uh, I just want recognition, <laughs> as I will say every episode. Okay. I do want to make some corrections from the last episode. First up, I defined a PRO, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. I think I said performance royalty organization. No. Oh. It's a performance rights organization. Mm. So for anyone that shook their head at that, you were right. That is not what it stood for. Interesting. I corrected myself. Uh, I believe we said that country music at the time was r- unrecognizable from the tenets <laughs> of classic country. We meant to insinuate, which I think this was insinuated, it's mainstream country. Yes. Mainstream country at the time of Garth Brooks did not have the tenets of classic country. Was there classic country being made? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Just like there is right now. There's classic country being made in Japan at this very second. Yeah. You know? Oh, Japan has everything. Seems like a really wonderful place. <laughs> Chris Gaines probably Would have did... blown up right? in Japan. Would have blown up, without yeah. a doubt. I wanted to note that Garth's video for the Thunder Rolls was banned, which we did talk about uh, because of its depiction of domestic violence. But I just wanted to make a special note here again that Garth stood by the video and I want to commend him for not only being quote unquote controversial, but he stood by it. And I think a lot of mainstream country artists would have caved. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Almost all of them. I Almost think, all of them. Anyone in the Dixie Chicks wouldn't cave. Garth, it's such a small Garth number. wouldn't cave. Yeah. And But anyone else at the time almost certainly would have caved. Absolutely. Yeah. Massive kudos mm-hmm. for that. I mean, I know he's a huge artist, so he has a lot of sway. But like, he's a game player. He plays the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? He could have caved, but I think he understood the impact of the video and like it actually carries like a legit message. So. Absolutely. Good job, Garth. And lastly, the big one, multiple people added me on this. We did mention that 80s and 90s country stars were not sexy. <laughs> Caught some flack on that. Oh. So let me be clear. In the context of the episode, Garth was saying his music exudes so much sex. He's just, it's always going to be there. We found that to be a little outlandish <laughs> because there doesn't seem to be a lot of sex in Garth music to us. Personally, to me and my view of sexy and sex appeal. Now, if you want to talk about Randy Travis, George Strait, Travis Tritt, Dwight Yoakam, Lyle Lovett. Dwight Yoakam's hot. Lyle Lovett was married to uh, Julia Roberts. That's right. I mean, that was a thing. Yeah. So 
That's just to say there were sexy country stars. Yeah, and I just generally don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about country music. So I'll, I'll <laughs> say things that sound like I know exactly what I'm saying, but I don't. I will just, say... I, I want to repeat that, and I want everyone to keep that in mind going forward. Well, I got a lot of messages about that, and then I went and started looking up these artists to be like, hmm, are, were they sexy? They got like a strong daddy vibe to them. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would make sense. Were w- These were women, heterosexual women telling Heteros- you? Who yes. would these sexy ones were? Yes. Okay. So they were sexy men for sure, but their vibe was very daddy. That's funny because when we were talking like sexy country stars, I guess the first person that popped in my head was like Reba, honestly, I guess. To but that's a real mom vibe. But she's like, she got a tight body. Her yeah. hair is great. You know, she's got a wild streak in her. Yeah. I don't know. That's I mean, fun. I go with the, uh, you don't impress me much. You know what I mean? That was so much later, though. But we're talking like late 80s. Yeah. That but, didn't impress but me also, much. It's like 10 years later. But also 90s. Garth's coming up in the 90s. We covered that decade. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I guess when I'm thinking of Garth's career, just... 80s country to me is so completely different from 90s country, which starts in 1995, I guess. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, that's like, also... I have my own touchstones and templates for what anything is or was. No, I think that's important to remember. A decade might be from 1990 to 1999 or whatever, but... When the you... 20th century didn't start until World, World War One. Yeah, culturally, those numbers don't add up. The 20th century ended on September 11th, 2001. Wow. Just saying. Went there. Okay. <laughs> One last thing before we get into the, the real meat of the episode. I found an article um, from the Star Phoenix from August 9th, 2019. So very recently where the interviewer was asking Garth Brooks about his thoughts on the Childish Gambino cover oh, that of was just Lost last in week. You. Yeah. yeah. And they asked him if he was going to play Lost in You tonight at his big concert. And Garth said, no, you won't hear that song tonight. But I thought Childish did fabulous. I don't think he covered it. I think he owned it. Beautiful. He says the Gaines character was exactly that. It was a character, somebody you were playing that wasn't you. So it's fun to kind of put them side by side and see that there's a lot of similarities. Still really, really proud of that project, proud of the playing on that project. So I've seen some headlines from like one of these big publications saying, (laughs) Garth refuses to talk about Chris Gaines. That's just not true. Great playing on that project is like that thing of when uh, they were talking to Aretha Franklin and asking her, like, what do you think of all the new pop singers? And she's just like, oh, she's got great gowns. Oh, yeah. You know, Mm, that is that is a rough. (laughs) That's what that sounds like to me. Yeah. That's all of our housekeeping. Cool, cool, cool. Covered all our things. I mean, the last episode was phenomenal. We did a fantastic job. And that episode was all about the man, the myth, the legend, Garth Brooks. Garth Brooks. So This episode. Is about the myth. (laughs) The legend. (laughs) The fabrication. The ephemera. The ephemeral. The ephemeral pixie, manic pixie dream Um, man. Are there manic pixie dream boys? Is that a thing? Chris Gaines is probably one. And there's our topic. There you go. Christian Jean Gaines, born August 10th, 1967 in Brisbane, Australia. Father, Jean Gaines, former swim coach for the Long Beach State University and former coach of both the U.S. and Australian Olympic swim teams. So can teams. you do that? Can you just, can you coach for different countries? Does, it, does your nationality matter in terms of coaching? I'm really proud to say I don't know anything <laughs> about Olympic coaches. Okay. His mother, Carolyn Johns Gaines, was a former swimmer for the Australian Olympic swim team and Commonwealth Games medalist. (laughs) Commonwealth Games, yes. So, Ashley, what are the Commonwealth Games? Well, the Commonwealth Games are basically the Olympics for countries that were or are maybe still in officially the British Empire. So it would be like Canada, Australia, South Africa, maybe India is still, you know, Ghana. Yeah. Places like that. So she's very accomplished. Oh, hugely accomplished. Hugely yeah. accomplished. I mean, the Olympics are very selective. Yeah. I mean, she's a medalist in a games that I've never heard of. So <laughs> good for her. And she did it with a family. She did it with family. Now, uh, he is an only child. Chris mm-hmm. Gaines was an only child. Yes. Uh, he is a Leo, a <laughs> yes. lion, fire. Looked up a couple of those attributes. He has the determination to make sure things get done. He's inherently proactive. He's driven by his own tuition. Ooh. He dislikes almost every change. 
prefers clear paths, rules, and procedures, and has great willpower. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. 1972, when he's five, Chris Gaines is five, he moves to a Los Angeles suburb, an unspecified Yes, we Los don't know Angeles where suburb. specifically, probably north. Now, using some context clues, we later learn that he goes to Morningside High School, which is located in Inglewood, California. So... That's a suburb of L.A., mm-hmm. so maybe we can assume that he moved to Inglewood. I don't know. I don't even know if that adds up, but we get him moving to a Los Angeles suburb, and his, during adolescence, his father is pressuring him to be a swimmer. Yeah, um, I watched The Life of Chris Gaines. The Behind the Life of Chris Gaines? Behind the Life of Chris Gaines, yeah, and Chris has some really, really choice quotes just throughout that Um that I, I yes. want to share with you. Yes. As, as we go throughout his life, Chris has certain things to say about his life. As far as that, he said, my father wanted me to swim, of course. I think everybody in my family wanted me to swim. Wouldn't that just be his mom? Yeah. His other person in his family? That's it. That's his whole family, his oh. mom and his dad. No, they probably had aunts and uncles. It's in Australia. Yeah. They were like, swim back home, Christian. We miss you. Yeah. I mean, having family pressure to do sports... When you don't want to do sports. Pretty common tale. Very, very common, especially for boys, I'm guessing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it can be really intense and sad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I won't share any personal stories this on that This is funny note. to me, a woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in high school, Morningside High School, Christian Gaines befriends Tommy Levitz. And immediately they are bonded as brothers. Best friends. Yes. Best friends, best friends, best friends. But that makes sense to me because everything we learn about Tommy is he is just a preternatural star at everything he lays his hands on. Yeah, I mean... The Midas man. Yeah. Ex- he is... He's a pilot at the age of 16 years he, old. He has his pilot's license. Yeah, he's, private pilot's license. That's he's amazing. He's a musician. He's already basically a musical genius as a teenager. Yeah, so as Chris's uh, interest in music, not sports, is growing, he's befriended Tommy Levitz, and they, they kind of bond over this kind of quest to be the next Lennon and McCartney. Mm-hmm, yes, very much. That was the goal. Yeah, directly cited in Behind the Life. <laughs> Uh, So they form a band called Crush with another friend of theirs called Mark Obed and start gigging around L.A., you know? They They played the Whiskey A Go-Go. They played the Troubadour. Mm -hmm. Countless places. And you know what one of the big benefits was other than playing music? What? Ladies. Oh, my God, how sexy. Oh, so many ladies. The women, I can't imagine, like these mid-80s L.A. Sunset Strip rock babes. Yeah. Throwing themselves. Do you think he probably had like a little bit of an Australian accent too? Like a, oh, for like sure. A, like a skosh of one left yeah. from his childhood days. Yeah, yeah, he moved to LA when he was five. And I want to and I want to really remind everyone that young Chris was beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Stunning. Yes. Stunningly beautiful man. Yes. Uh, some might say he looks like a young Brad Pitt. I would go that far. Like if Brad Pitt had pretty long Viking hair. So yeah, like Legends of the Fall. Brad I would Pitt. even go as far as Seven Years in Tibet. I would... Interview with the Vampire Pit. Oh, whoa. Nothing is that beautiful. <laughs> Few things are that beautiful, but Chris Gaines was. Yeah. In 1985. In 1985, As yeah. a teen playing at the Whiskey A Go-Go. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. 80s hair was something else back then but he had a he had a great hairstyle i completely agree he didn't go for that motley crew thing yeah well it was interesting uh chris and tommy and mark's band crush you know it was the 80s and they were playing rock music but it was kind of like 60s throwback rock yeah. music and not there, it wasn't poison it wasn't you know yeah. what was going on in LA at the time totally. yeah there was no like guns and roses hair mm-hmm. metal type influence at all nothing this was like that very much XTC, like, <laughs> you know, like much more. Let imp- love rule. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Lenny yeah. Kravitz. Um, so while they're playing one of these gigs, uh, Roma Still, I believe that's how you pronounce her last mm-hmm. name. Noted them. talent scout. Yeah. Big deal. Huge deal. Yeah. Catches them and signs them as her. She's the manager now. Yeah. She's their management uh, and gets Joe Smith from Capitol Records to come out and see them play. Mm hmm. He loves them. Immediately. Of course. He, he, he gives those boys a big old record contract is what he does. Absolutely. Chris wants to quit high school. And he does. He does. Much to his parents' chagrin. But you know what? Gets his GED later. That's really important. His mama told him to. You got to have that education. And you got to, you know, if, if swimming doesn't work out and music doesn't work out and your looks don't work out. You should have a GED. You should have a GED. Yeah. So we agree. 
but he quits high school and starts working on the Crush album. Uh, there's a little bit was of con- this their self-titled debut this was their self-titled debut yes. uh, 1986 there's a little bit of controversy as this record is released oh the record the infamous record cover yeah chris gaines a little bit of a i don't know bad boy yeah. has given the bird with <laughs> both of his fingers on the album cover oh that is so notorious chris had something to say about that in the behind the life he said i think the bird was more intended to the system and it was a message I think we were sending out that we were going to do things our way. Wow. Take but, that, Capital. Yeah. So the first album is released in 1986. Gaines is only 19. First album coming out on a major record label. Super, super young man. Man, that's wow. awesome. They go in to shoot a video for the song My Love Tells You So, which is the second single from the record. And they kind of hate the process. As we've been been hearing through Gaines' experience, uh, he's not a fan of being told what to do. He's Just not- the whole like music industry game yeah. seems really hard for him. He's 19. I understand being a little obstinate. Mm-hmm. It happens. And, you know, when you film a music video, you lip sync to the song. You don't actually play it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> I have they, a, so they were 19 years old and just found out what a music video is. Yes. Okay. I mean, and they were they lived in L.A., so there was no way for them to know. In, in the mid-1980s, yes. the least popular era of music videos mm-hmm. in very, global, global history. Very hard to come by in the, in the mid-80s. Yeah, yeah. I have a quote from Gaines that says, It was bogus. It was stupid. We were not a lip-syncing band. We were better than that. Wow. Which, you know, I can recall when like Britney Spears and all these other bands kind of were coming up in the late 2000s, there was a lot of lip syncing happening and a lot of people were kind of mad about it. I mean, it, it was kind of a, a change of being a performant artist. Uh, you know, they were more like pop stars. Yeah, it, but that's not what a music video is. <laughs> like, no. that's real, <laughs> like, it's really funny. Did they think it was a live performance that was going to be recorded? I don't know. You know? can't get into Chris's head at that point. Who but can? you know what? I've seen the video. And it's kind of awesome. It's not a bad video. It's really not a bad video. No. Uh, it kind of reminds me of uh, the sweater song from Weezer, where they're just kind of on a white background running around. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, it's very monkeys. It's very monkeys. Yeah. Uh, they refuse to, to lip sync. And mm-hmm. they're just kind of like making faces and goofing off as a... 19 year olds in a band isn't that what like every punk band did on top of the pops when they were like for oh, sure yeah yeah um, i'm not actually gonna do this yeah <laughs> uh, i mean but you know you had a, a lot of that influence in the 80s as well a lot of that punk oh without a doubt yeah, yeah. a little bit of that in games especially in the los angeles area uh, you know it rubbed off yeah you know it rubbed off yeah leather jackets everywhere so my love tells me so they do the video it's released and it Explodes. A fucking huge, amazing hit. Yeah. Huge smash, smash hit that the likes of which this country has never seen. Yeah, I mean, they start on a tour immediately. 19 years old, have released their second single. But the tour was 50 States and 50 Nights, is what you need to remember. 50 States and 50 Nights. 50 States and 50 Nights. Whirlwind. How? How? The pressure. The busyness. You're all, I mean, you know, there's life on the road and then there's that. Yeah. I mean, that sounds uh, crushing. <laughs> Difficult. What's the so? Do you go from Alaska to, and then you just fly down to Seattle? I guess I'm really I'm interested in the logistics of this planning I mean, you, wise. You gotta end. Well, we don't know if it's 50 unique states. Could be the same. <laughs> it could just be the same two states back and forth. Yeah, just crossing over like Mississippi and Alabama 25 yeah. times. All right. But if it's all 50 states, then you'd have to end with Alaska and Hawaii, right? You have to end there. I would end in Hawaii. You're right. Yeah, for sure. So it was a platinum record, though, right? That was like. Like, yeah, really, we... yeah, the single was number one. The album went platinum. And Chris said of this, from from that point on, they were just doing everything they could possibly do to catch up. Yeah. Based <laughs> on uh, the liner notes from In the Life of Chris Gaines, uh, we get a little bit of insight into uh, all of the songs that we have access to from the Gaines catalog. Mm-hmm. So Gaines says that this song that's on In the Life of Chris Gaines was actually a demo instead of the big studio version. They went in and recorded the a new big studio version and 
tried to make it sound just as good, but they just couldn't get it to sound right. He says, for example, the snapping fingers sound effect was only temporary and was supposed to be replaced. We just never found a sound we like better. There's a part in the song where there's a bunch of talking, where Gaines is talking. Uh, remember in Crush, Chris Gaines is not the singer. No, no, no. Chris Gaines is not the singer. No, Tommy is the singer Tommy and the singer. main songwriter. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they were going to go back and remix and remaster that song for the the Greatest Hits album, but they just couldn't make it sound any better. This is the demo. This is what wow. was released. So what we have heard is the song. That smash hit that everyone knows and loves. The yeah. My Love Tells Me So that still to this day is played at weddings. Uh, was a demo. Yeah. Fascinating. They crushed it. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. So they're on this World One tour. They are blowing up. Very well known. Uh, they come back uh, to L.A., uh, or at least the West Coast somewhere, uh, just for a little downtime. They've got a show coming up, I believe, in Texas somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, Tommy, with his pilot's license, tells Gaines that he wants to go for a night flight. Uh, just clear his head. Quick, quick little L.A. to Texas. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Gaines, Chris was supposed to go with him. And, and he told him it was too dark. Yeah. Not good. Not going to go. But please wait until the morning. Yeah, I'll go with you in the morning. promise me. Promise me you will wait until tomorrow morning to fly your plane. Tommy promised. Tommy lied. Oh, my God. And he went on this flight, December 11th, 1986. Mm -hmm. And it's a night flight. There's heavy weather over the New Mexico mountains. And Tommy's plane drops off the radar. He's only 19 years old. And he dies. He's only 19 years old. Pretty devastating. That's so sad. His best friend. This is this was not just the man that was his brother. He also looked up to Tommy like he was God, he yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine McCartney dying in a plane crash. I mean... That'd be fucked up. It'd be fucked up. Yeah. So this is devastating. It's so sad. In, uh, 1986, Gaines is devastated. Uh, his, his management tries to get a new singer for mm-hmm. Crush, which is just disgusting but tommy was crushed tommy was the music yeah you know uh crush was dead without a doubt yeah without a doubt without tommy tommy levitt's mom gave Gaines a ring that tommy was wearing at the time and Gaines continues to wear that ring chris chris wears the i mean you can look it up yourself you can look it up yourself chris is wearing tommy's ring when you see constantly. promo photos of chris Gaines, look for the ring it's there it's, it's there. absolutely there yeah uh, so that was 86, and I cannot say that 1987 was any better, no. unfortunately. I well, got a one-two punch mm-hmm. as Gene Gaines, Chris's father, is diagnosed with cancer. Gaines realizes he doesn't really have much time to win his father's approval, approval. basically. Yeah. yeah. So Gene starts undergoing chemo. Mm-hmm. And what happens with Chris? Like, what is he going to do? His band is gone. He's devastated with the loss of his best friend. His distant father is now really sick. And yeah. it's like time is ticking before I can make my daddy love me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know? So Joe Smith from Capitol Records, who signed Crush initially, d- discusses a solo career with Gaines and puts him in the studio with legendary producer Don Was. The Don Was. The Don Was. Of Was Not Was. Uh, walking the dinosaur. That's Everybody the guy. walked the dinosaur. That's the guy. So they go in to record Chris's first solo album uh, throughout 1987 and mm-hmm. 88. And in the fall of 1989, he releases his first solo album entitled Straight Jacket. Now, did the t- where did the title Straight Jacket come from? What was the inspiration there? Much like the middle fingers on the cover, this was Gaines' way of saying that the record company was trying to control him, mm. was putting him in a straight jacket, was just not letting him be creative in the way that he fully wanted to be. I can imagine how that would be frustrating for an artist. Yeah. According to uh, my readings, the album spent an extraordinary 224 weeks on the Billboard <laughs> Top 200 Albums chart. I, I mean, that's four years, Honestly, right? yeah. that, that has to be a typo. It, it has, has to, to be. be a typo. I've looked at it multiple <laughs> times. Was this in the book, in the CD of the Greatest Hits book? Indeed. 224? Yeah, I thought so. So one extra two there is really going to change things. 24 weeks is half a year. 224 weeks is four years. Yes, a little okay. over four years. Yeah. That is quite some time <laughs> for an album to be on the, but we don't know where on the top 200 could have been a 200 it could be a 200 for four ex- very good point yeah but anyway regardless of whatever that typo may or may not be that's a long time mm-hmm. to spend on the charts uh, uh, i mean but that record digging for gold yeah which white we, flag 
maybe. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's still. There were huge hits on that record. Yeah, it's still Chris's best selling album to date. And but that, he, yeah, and that record also gave audiences a chance to see Chris on his own for the first, like, no disrespect to Tommy. You know, but now this was Chris without Tommy. Right. Though I will say the song maybe on the album is has a real Beatles vibe. Mm, like, for sure. Definitely feels like an ode maybe to uh, to Tommy. Yesterday the odds were stacked in favor of my expectation. Flying above the rest. Never falling from the nest. In fact, according to our liner notes that we can reference, we know that this song was written for Tommy. Gaines used to go out and sit in the mountain range where Tommy's plane went down and... Like you do. And listen to the wind through the trees. It's a really poignant passage here, actually, from from Gaines about how this song came to him and how he was sitting at the mountain range where his best friend died. I'm going to read just a little of this. I was determined that my music died with him and that I would not go on without him. In the fall of 87, I took a drive like I had done so many times before, but this time there was something different about the mountains. There was a peace. I left there that evening with a new outlook on my music and my life. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's poignant. It's so sad. Yeah. So sad. Pretty amazing that it was a, a hit. That's a really nice way to... To tribute. honor your friend, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. In previous episodes, we've talked about the song "Digging for Gold." <laughs> one, of, one of my favorites, yeah. in an odd way. Yeah, it it has a Fleetwood Mac vibe to me, and it has a lyrical content that's you know we discussed this before. This is about a a daddy that uh, <laughs> a really really rich daddy, a really a really, really, really rich daddy <laughs> who yeah. marries his baby, but he's like, but does she love me? It's very sad. Yeah, um, it's inspired <laughs> by the uh, Carol Wells classic, Poison Kisses. I love Poison Kisses. I love po- I, all those late nights watching Turner Classic movies, Poison mm-hmm. Kisses. Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, it's it's based on a quote from Max Horton, uh, and, and he says, do you love me, darling, or are you just digging for gold? Uh, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then the other track that we mentioned, White Flag, uh, that's about a relationship. So it's about in a very intense relationship. I mean, Gaines is known for being kind of a, a womanizer. All of his relationships, brief as they were, were probably very, very, very intense. I There was a great quote on the Behind the Life of Gaines where I believe it was a manager said, talking about backstage, there were more women there than I could count on one hand. And I'm like, so what, like six? I mean, six ladies. Yeah, so... Yeah, six. Six. (laughs) (laughs) He only went as high as six at a time. Well, I mean. I don't know. I wasn't there. It's a bed full. Uh, (laughs) But uh, this album, Straight Jacket, the debut solo record, sells 12 million copies. 12 million copies is a lot of records. He's 22 years old. This is his second album that he's put into the world, and it's sold 12 million copies. He buys a house in Malibu, but his dad still doesn't really acknowledge his success, which is, to me, just kind of insane. I don't even... It's like, you know, no, it's not winning silver in the Commonwealth Games. I know. But I think selling 12 million albums is pretty good. Yeah, uh, especially in 1989. And, you know, I know a lot of musicians. I know a lot of musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Having a huge hit single with your first band and then releasing a solo album as yourself, selling 12 million (laughs) copies, pretty unheard of. Yeah, I did some, I was just curious, like, for comparison's sake, like, what were some other, like, late 80s high-selling records? Uh, Madonna's Like a Prayer sold 15 million copies. I think that's 15 million to date, so that's probably from, like, 89 to 2019. Uh, Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation is hitting about 12, so Chris's solo work, he's up there with, like, the top of the top of the top. Janet. That's a good Janet, record. number one. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good record. Now, that's fall of 1989. You know, Gaines is on tour. He's known for having a pretty crazy life on tour. I mean, Womanizer was polite. Yeah. I mean, aside from, from all of the women, uh, there's anecdotes that he brought chainsaws on tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, just 
kind of crazy, you know? Just sex, drugs, rock and roll. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, for sure. And then in November of 1990, Gene Gaines... Dies of cancer. November 15th, yeah. Yeah, he lost his three-year battle with cancer. I mean, that's... That's devastating for anyone. Absolutely, particularly given that just a few years prior, his best friend died. Mm -hmm. I mean... I know. There's a lot of death in Gaines' life. It's very hard to overcome. And what's, what's even sadder and what's even more of a struggle is only weeks after his dad dies, Chris finds out he's basically being robbed. Yes, his management that initially signed Crush and kind of made him mm-hmm. up to this point has been stealing all of his money. Yeah, uh, he sold all his millions of records. He had what, like 500K in the bank? Yeah, it's quoted as saying he made, he sold 12 million, but only made half a million to a million dollars. He didn't even own the house he bought thought he bought yeah in the end yeah he he hadn't read his record contract <laughs> he didn't read his record contract which i don't no. think is you know that's, uncommon yeah you're 19 it's you're legalese what do i even understand this it's pretty you know? hard to read yeah in general but he'd been sleeping with his manager so there was As a little blurry line there and uh Roma. yeah she's he, shady i mean yeah. she's such a shady character it's like from the beginning well, I mean, she she picked him up from the, you know, the Sunset Strip. Don't you want strip. me, baby? Yeah, we've all heard the song, but it's like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he sues her because uh-huh. this is outlandish, but eventually decides to just settle the case and walk away. Take yeah. a hit. T- walking away from 12 million copies sold, but he does get to keep his house, which is... And he got his... Wasn't he able to hold on to, like, his songwriting stuff after that? Right. Like, yeah. So, early 1991, his his father has passed uh, at the end of the previous year. He's gone through this horrible thing, goes back into the studio with Don Was. Yeah. Um, Don said, at this point in Chris's life, just because of all this strife and stress, it said he was questioning all of human nature. I that's mean, how that's how that's, that's fair, the hand though. life has dealt him at that point I mean, you know uh, best friend dies father dies your after father, a multiple years your father years by the struggle. way who like never respected you and right. your career yes yeah and then your lover slash manager is stealing from you yeah mm-hmm. not a great setup and he's all of 24 or something. Yeah. Yeah. He's 24 years old. So in November of 1991, after being in the studio with Don, a year to the day after his father's death. Oh, wow. Gaines releases Fornicopia. It's a dark record, obviously. F-O-R-N-U-C-O-P-I-A. Yeah. Fornicopia. Yeah. Yes. It's like a cornucopia. Yeah. I mean, it was November. Cornucopias are huge in November. <laughs> one time a year yeah <laughs> um but you know it, it did it did well it spent a combined 18 weeks on the top mm-hmm. of the billboard top 200 album charts and included a soulful remake of the 1972 ramsey sellers classic it don't matter to the sun uh and this the track main street so just to give a little background on both of those songs it don't matter to the sun the ramsey sellers song Gaines says, uh, some people think I recorded this for my father. When I was a kid, he had every record Ramsey Sellers ever made. His favorite song was It Don't Matter to the Sun. He sang that song to my mother for as long as I can remember. After my father's death, my mother had no one to sing the song to her. Truth is, I recorded this song for her. It don't matter to the sun. If you go or if you stay You know the sun is gonna rise Wow. 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 Yeah, I got got my heart. I got a little hot eyes from that. Right? My heart. It feels it. Yeah. Then Main Street is considered a a pretty huge hit for him as well. Um, You know, mostly about a guy who just can't get out of town and he, he, he grew up in a small town he wants to see the world and just can't get out of it never did the things i thought I would would left just didn't know i could things don't work out Gaines actually runs into a guy from from high school that that kind of inspired this song and he asked him why he never left and he said he was afraid if he left and didn't become a success he could never go back wow I feel like a lot of people kind of have 
that I think that's feeling. a really common feeling for probably most people who grow up in really small kind of places. Yeah, or, or even I hometowns. Mean, it, Anywhere. I grew up in Chicago, but I want to make it in L.A. Yeah, or something. Right. Yeah, it's a thing, you know. And Fornicopia, this was like a darker, more yeah. serious album. Than, Angry. Yeah, than certainly Crush and even, you know, Chris's earlier work. Right, for yeah. sure. Oh, my God. So in the winter of 92, which is almost one year after this, Chris is back in the studio. So he's been touring. He's been supporting this record. He's been writing new songs. Winter of 92, uh, he's at Ocean Way Studios in L.A. Uh, you know, he lives in Malibu, mm-hmm. kept that house. And after a late night session with, with Don, he is going to drive home. Don asks him to just sleep on the couch, you know, but he's yeah. insistent that he go sleep off at home. February 16th, 1992, Chris falls asleep at the wheel going 90 miles per hour. Unbelievable. Soars off of a cliff. This is unbelievable it's it is certainly unbelievable uh (laughs) the car flipped end over end and it was found 200 feet away from the road and somehow Gaines is able to call 911 yeah he had a he was rich enough to have a cell phone in 1992 and he called 911 but by the time the paramedics had arrived he was he was slipping into a coma yeah he was in a coma for four days he woke up in the hospital and he was extremely bad off his jaw was almost ripped off his shoulder was ripped apart his arms were broken and his pelvis was smashed to bits and here is okay okay so but i also wanted so that's so horrifying to think about Uh, but here's something even more horrifying because it was chris's state of mind because the doctors were telling you know your hands you're you're never going to play music again but he wasn't even thinking about that he was worried that he was never going to have sex again (sighs) priorities chris chris (sighs) <sighs> he's in the hospital for six weeks and two years of rehab, including 18 months of plastic surgery, reconstructing his face. Mm-hmm. Yes. His beautiful Brad Pitty face. That, that Greek god, the the Viking warrior. Yeah. All gone. I mean. And he was only, what, 25? Yeah. <sighs> It's just, it's horrible. I mean, he basically became a bag of bones and then gets rebuilt as this new thing. I mean, how? You know? It doesn't even, even matter what your face looks like. If your face is your face and it's like, time for a new one, it's going to suck. Yeah, absolutely. He, you'd be unrecognizable. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine being in that scenario. Just a horrific. nightmare. Horrific. A nightmare. Especially as a performer that's known for being in the Very public. Very good point that I hadn't even considered. Very good point. Yeah. yeah. So 1993, you know, he's just nowhere he's just at home he's recovering he's doing rehab he's hiding the physical pain that he must have been in i mean I, I i've never broken a bone same and i can't imagine having my jaw almost ripped off my shoulder ripped apart my arms broken and my pelvis smashed up i mean that's a long list any one of those things would ruin my life oh, absolutely <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 1993, he's on the mend. He's he's kind of writing songs, but he's not in the public view. So, at the end of 1993, um, this is you know February 92 is when this horrible car wreck happens. November 93, uh, he's in the studio again, his home studio in Malibu, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Ryan Duffy, one of his his pals, and there's fires in the hills like very classic california problem this one was an arsonist too this was an arsonist forest fire specifically thousands of acres are in flames and you know i think Gaines is maybe being a little arrogant and didn't leave the house and just assumed it wouldn't get to him but it does homeowners were trying to like spray down the roofs that were spraying hoses on their houses to yeah. just soak everything and try to repel it that's like he chris climbed on the roof and that's what he's doing he's hosing down his house but it right. absolutely doesn't work fighting a f- arsonist fire like this with a hose i mean <laughs> i'm sure it happens yeah i'm sure it happens yeah. but it's uh that's just Long story short, he lost the house. Yeah, the house burned down. So that's 
at the end of 1993, he's resilient, though, and he quickly Mm -hmm. rebuilds his house. He refuses to leave Malibu. It's interesting because he was dating a woman at the time, and it's like he's, you know, his relationships aren't Chris's strong suit, but there's this woman, Maria, sort of a long-term girlfriend who's been with him through thick and thin, really, the good times and the bad. And she had something really insightful to say after the fire. She says that was a way for him to start over. I mean, you know, quite it's a, literally. You, he lost absolutely everything. Yeah. So you have to start from scratch. And you have to imagine in 93, you're not backing up your, all your stuff <laughs> into the cloud. No, you know? family photo albums, gone. Uh, mom's Olympic medal, gone. All your favorite guitars, gone. All, all your relics, everything that maybe from Ev- Crush. Yeah, I mean, all the, oh God, like Tommy's lyrics handwritten, uh, you know? Yeah, I hope he had a vault because that's devastating to lose all that. So starting over, you know, 1994, he, he rebuilds the home. He starts putting those songs back down again. Um, and despite not still not wanting to be in the public eye, finishes his third solo album, Apostle. He's not even on the cover. That's incredible. It's released in the winter of 94, uh, December 1994. He still refuses to be photographed. He won't do music videos. He's not going to go on tour. Uh, But he handed in a great album, you know? And I guess that speaks for itself, really, at the end of the day. I think record companies have a really hard time, you know. With the music? Just promoting the music (laughs) without, you know, a a tour or a music video. Pretty face or, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's tough. What's the hook? Yeah. Uh, It did spend a combined eight weeks atop the Billboard Top 200 chart and featured the singles Way of the Girl and Unsigned Letter, which I think are two songs that are very noteworthy Mm -hmm. uh, in our history here. Way of the Girl, for uh, those of you that remember, is the song that Chris Gaines plays on his Saturday Night Live appearance. Yes. It's great. It's a really rocking song I'm, I'm a fan personally but the really interesting song is unsigned letter this one is very interesting yeah Yeah, so Unsigned Letter has quite the background pertaining to Gaines's car wreck and particularly his rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. He speaks of this in the booklet and talks about how he had a nurse taking care of him after his accident. She was very plain Jane, but seemed to be content with her career. You know, with his jaws wired shut, he couldn't really talk. Because his jaw was almost ripped off his face. So you got to, doctors got to like smash that back in and sew it yeah. shut. So, yeah. Yeah. So he would write her letters. Oh. Yeah. Very short letters, and she would reply. Gaines says, I always wondered how she would react if she got an unsigned letter from love. We are still friends, and she's still the same, but at the risk of embarrassing myself if she reads this, sometimes I still wonder what she would be like if she ever let go. I don't know what that means. Like, let go of being, like, stayed? Like, stop being a little so, like, buttoned up, maybe? I would love to know more about the relationship between this nurse and Gaines. She brings him back to life from these horrible circumstances. Yeah. And uh, and he's in a really, really vulnerable position. Yeah. His life's kind of in the crapper when all that stuff happens. And she brings him back. And what's the story there? Kindness and friendship. Do you think there's anything more there? With Gaines? You never know. There might be more. He loved the ladies. He did love the ladies. So here we are at the end of 1994, rolling right into 1995, and I think Gaines' sex addiction is kind of catching up with him. Yeah, do you remember the, the girlfriend I mentioned earlier, Maria? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She had been with him through thick and thin. Uh, While he's, like, consistently oh, cheating oh, on her. Oh, constantly, without a doubt, yeah. With Chris, the whole world was his stage, and that tended to cross over into the bedroom. Whoa. Wow. Very... Kind of sexy, kind of hot. Yeah. I'm with it. I'm with it. Yeah. I can get down with that. That's good. But not in like a relationship context. So right. Right. Chris decides to make a change. He goes and gets some treatment, mm-hmm. which is great. If you have a problem, get treatment. Absolutely. Um, and he realizes at this time that this issue that he has with being a womanizer and being addicted to sex is largely rooted in these troubles that he had with his father. Specifically, yeah. 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 Uh, The lack of acceptance, needing affirmation, needing constant acceptance, all stems from his father Mm -hmm. not accepting him. And it kind of saves his relationship. I know. I think that's wonderful. Kind of saves him as a person, I think. (laughs) I think that's fair to say. Yeah, it's just that need for acceptance. It's that it's that entertainer neediness. It's like, for sure. is, is a screaming audience enough for you? Is millions of records sold enough for you? It's not. It's not. 
No, you got to have the strange women every night. But you know, two or more. Sometimes sisters. Sometimes up to six women. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, the sisters part was really gross. That was when an ex knew that he had a problem was when he wanted her and her sister at the same time. And the sister was cool with it. Just, okay. Interesting. That person should also go to therapy. Um, (laughs) So 1995, he's kind of dealt with his sex addiction. He's kind of improving himself. Turning some corners. And you know, when you have that experience, when you kind of cleanse yourself, his house burns down and gives him a physical reboot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mentally, he's kind of been rebooted. He goes on a bit of a spirit quest. Where would you go on your spirit quest? Where would you go? You're on your spirit quest. You can pick one place in the world for your spirit quest. Where do you go? I mean, I'm... I would have a myriad of answers in that. I don't know if I could pick just one place. You'd have to go somewhere that allowed you to do some uh, heavy psychedelic drugs to like figure <laughs> right? yourself yeah, yeah, out, yeah. right? Peru, maybe. Cool. You know, what yeah, about yeah. yourself? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, private, just countryside, beautiful, like a manor? countryside, beautiful manners in the countryside mm. with no pressures or responsibilities or anything like that. But you know, I'm a different person from Christian. Jean. See, you're a writer, you know? Yeah, I'm a writer, and Chris is a musician, and musicians need to hear other music to feel vivified, to be alive, right? To, to feel inspired. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so Chris's spirit quest is in the great state of Mississippi. Yeah. He <laughs> Heads, which I love, which I love. Heads down to the Mississippi Delta. For those of you listening to this that have never been to Mississippi, it's an interesting state. It is the home of a lot of R&B and soul, and which is then the, the bedrock of rock and roll. Indeed. But it's not a real vacation-y spot. Not so much. Uh, but Gaines goes on this, quote, deeply personal search for the roots of rock and roll. For two months. For two months. And comes back with something the critics thought he'd never have what was that michael soul wow maria was also a large influence on this Mm -hmm. on this style that comes back this r&b style Gaines releases a new record entitled triangle triangle and the media dubs him the new prince (gasps) how exciting for him i mean what a what, what a what an honor yeah in 1996 i bet the old prince was not Please that had to about have that. hurt. <laughs> that had to have hurt. Yeah. Um, I think he was the symbol at this point, though. So we were in the uh, market true. for a new prince, that's true. to be fair. That's true. That was a very confusing time. <laughs> but it was a very distinct musical change, like a stylistic change for Gaines uh, with the songs Drifting Away, mm-hmm. That's the Way I Remember It, mm-hmm. Snow in July. Yep. Um, those are all like a lot of the big featured hits. Getting into a few of the specifics on some of those. Well, Drifting Away is lovely because it's about his relationship. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of his epiphany, right? Yeah. Absolutely. With all of my heart, I know I could love you. But with all of my soul, I... After years and years of unsuccessful relationships, I found a woman who I would do more than die for. I would live for. I mean, come on. Yeah, legit. That's nice. Yeah, that's, that's nice. That's a positive way that's to be. That's nice. He does kind of have a little bit of an issue with the record label at this point, though. Mm. He doesn't feel like they're really backing him. He's got this new style. The media loves him, but it's not its not doing it. It's been a problem for him like throughout his career. It you know? has. And Probably he, a very common problem. He, he goes all the way and sues Capitol Records. Damn. Yeah. Joe Smith, who's been with him since the beginning. And not stealing from him. Well, like, did let him sign that contract, right? Well. He's not innocent. Oh, okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Why he's still his rep at Capitol is very confusing. <laughs> like, get a new guy, you know? Chris goes with what he knows. They do eventually drop that lawsuit, though, as they renegotiate gains a better royalty rate um, and give him a lot more creative mm-hmm. freedom so that they're not constantly giving him input on how he should sound. And I believe he's quoted as saying that at that point, it really freed him up to do 
even more new music. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too, because he was it scared him in a way as well. It frightened him, that freedom, because it it made me think I was getting older and I wasn't rebellious because he viewed himself as like in a partnership with the label now rather than as like a a head butter with them. That's rough, right? Yeah. When you kind of grow up a little bit. It's hard growing up. It is. Uh, You're not against the machine anymore. You're a part of it. (laughs) I mean, 12 million copies sold on that first record. I'm he failing was, to see. You were always he was a contributor, yeah. yeah. But you're you know, a gear at the very least. But he was a kid. I mean, you don't know at that point. But then we get up to September of 1999, and Chris releases his greatest hits. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of greatest course. hits, and of course, as with any greatest hits record, you must put new songs on your that's greatest the hits. One, record. That's the number one rule. I got to be honest. When I was a kid, first getting into music, nothing annoyed me more than having to get a greatest hits to hear the two new songs. It's such a scam. Yeah, and I never liked the new songs on any greatest hits personally, except for the Chris Gaines. The Chris best Gaines, of, of course. Yes, yeah, obviously, of course. I mean, obviously, I mean, obviously, you know. Yes, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about "Lost in You" and "Right Now," the mm-hmm. two new songs from the greatest hits, and they they're wonderful songs. We've talked about a lot of Chris's hits throughout this entire episode, but you want to talk hits? Well, "Lost in You" is it. Yeah. I'm head over it was actually originally written for the movie Revelations. Oh, Remember that movie, I do. Revelations? From the 90s, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the producers contacted Gaines and said they were looking for a title song, and they flew him out, he watched the movie, and he says, I know everyone will remember the movie for its special effects, but the love affair between Scott and Kennedy is what grabbed me. Mm-hmm. The whole world is coming to an end, and all that seems to matter to him is making sure that she knows how much he doesn't want to live if living means living without her wow classic gains i mean he's a ladies man he gets it he gets it yeah, you know? and you know i think post uh treatment i think it becomes a real s- sweetness i you can know? see that i agree with that yeah. yeah um and then right now uh the other new song is a real it's a real anthem you know it's a it's politically charged which historically gains has v- very much stayed he away tried from that. to shoot politics yeah uh his whole life really uh he thinks it's, it's all screwed up you know both sides yeah. both sides I right mean, but he ain't wrong maybe it's a high schools maybe it's a teacher's tattoos pipe bombs underneath the pictures maybe it's the music maybe it's the crack maybe it's the bible or could it be the lack come on And then he's also not wrong in right now because he's like the answer to all of this strife is love. Yeah. Wow. The truth is love is the answer. That's a direct quote from Chris Gaines. He's right. He's right. He's right. That song does feature... um I don't know if you. I don't know if it was lifted or if it's a. Uh, there's it's a, a sample. Yeah, I guess so. But he's singing it originally. Uh, it's a Young Blood song. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool integration of like the old '60s sort of style with this new Gaines style. Pretty neat. Pretty interesting Edgy integration. And '90s. Yeah. Yeah. And then in November of 1999, uh, Chris Gaines plays Saturday Night Live. Oh, um, yeah. He does choose to play "Way of the Girl" from his 1994 release, as as opposed to one of the new songs from the best. <laughs> yes, of. he does. Yeah. But you know that song was his post car crash release so maybe there was something to that you know meaningful to him in a way for an audience this large yeah yeah and then after that after 1999 uh, there was another album planned it's called he, the the Lamb. Yeah, he was he was going to release an album called The Lamb Which at was, the ripe old age of like 32. Yeah, ripe old age, a soundtrack to a film in which he is the primary character. Where he is the primary character. So I'm wondering, so we've got The Lamb here, and before that was Triangle was his album. Mm-hmm. I'm feeling like very biblical oh, with these things. Do you think Triangle is meant to represent like the Trinity? Holy uh, cow, holy cow. Yeah, I think an apostle prior to oh that. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. And do you know Fornicopia and Straightjacket <laughs> maybe don't uh, fall into those? But he was those. really young. Yeah. At those points, yeah. So what a life. What a, what a history. He's still wearing to this day, as far as I know, his best friend Tommy's ring. Yeah. 
the photos we've seen prove it. As far as I know, he's still in a happy relationship with his living girlfriend, Maria. Yeah. I think he got himself together. And I think that's really commendable. Come together. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Uh, And so much of Chris's life journey, his career, his personal life has been sort of a reaction to wanting his father's approval. Yeah. If his dad were alive, how do you think he would feel about Chris? You know, I think I think he would be proud of him. Yeah. Uh, I don't think he would trust the the music industry any more than he ever did. Mm-hmm. I think he'd probably tell him to get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Where do we go from here? That was the life of Chris Gaines. This is everything we know. We know. Yeah. This is everything we know about Chris Gaines. Yeah, uh, I did uh, encounter the MySpace page today mm-hmm. for Chris Gaines, which contains an absolute wealth of images yes. from the entire life of Chris Gaines that yes. we know. And one thing that I found on there, and I don't know if this is canon or not, but, uh, you know, MySpace 2003, maybe a little untrustworthy. There's a music portion of this MySpace page, and it lists a song from the lamb one of the songs on the music player is listed as from the lamb called wrapped up in you oh okay not on the best of no it's not potentially leaked (gasps) to the myspace page at some point but it does show up on another album from a rather large country star a couple years later oh really yeah that's so interesting i don't know if you're familiar with the works of garth brooks i've heard of him uh but he put out an album called scarecrow which Mm. Which contain it, it came out in 2001. It did, after the Christmas album. Uh, yes, and it contains the song Wrapped Up in You, which, if this MySpace page is to be believed, that may have been originally a Chris Gaines song that's, from The Lamb. That's super fun to think about. The album that never was. That's super fun to think about. Also, in your research, <laughs> I don't even know how to set up the nurse. Yeah, I don't either, but... Uh, <laughs> So do you guys remember 15 <laughs> minutes ago, when, which song was it? Letter, uh, unri- unsigned unsigned letter. letter. So the song Unsigned Letter was about letters sent back and forth between Chris and his hospital nurse when he was in a coma and suffering from not having a jaw and having a new face put on. Michael found... In my research, I am... Um... I was curious, what, what did ChrisGaines.com look like in 1999? Mm-hmm. So thankfully, we have the Wayback Machine, courtesy of Archive.org. Not a sponsor, but would, would take their money if they offered it. <laughs> and you can go back and look at the ChrisGaines.com from 1999. And part of that website links out to a fan site called The Nurse's Notes. And there's a full site here yeah. that consists of all of the notes written between Gaines and and the nurse. There's like how, there's like over 10. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's a lot of notes. <laughs> and they're fascinating. They are some reads. There's some reads. There's some reads. It's if you're looking for some stuff to read and you're like I wonder what this fictional nurse yeah, I'll would be have re- to say. If you thought you knew everything about Chris Gaines, you don't know shit about this. Oh my god. No so, one knows this. So we don't know if this is a fan site or Yeah, it could be a viral marketing. We plan. think it's proto viral marketing. Yes. I think it's proto viral marketing. I do too. I agree. I believe yeah. this was written as part of the Chris Gaines uh greatest experience. Hits experience. Yeah. yeah. And I'm gonna dive way more into it. <laughs> Yeah, I've only read read half the notes because, frankly, I, I'm kind of savoring them. You know, oh, smart. That's smart. <laughs> I don't want to Netflix it and just binge on them and it's over. <laughs> I want to like really enjoy Savor them. Savor them. Now, uh, one item that we didn't really talk about. I don't want to go too long because we we did such a great job covering the life of Gaines, but uh, we didn't mention what any of the album covers look like for mm. Gaines's for his releases, and I, I think they're worth taking note of. Uh, his original album, Straight Jacket, has. Let's start with Crush. Okay, let's start with Crush, right? With their notorious album cover. Well, you know, he's I think given that... double fingers. He's given double fingies. Oh, no. So I think what the controversy was, we may have misspoke, and we could go sub this in. Uh, a promo photo he was giving double oh. fingers the album cover 
is from the same shoot and he's not giving double fingies. He's just kind of he's kind of chilling out. I think that behind the music was inaccurate. Behind I the don't, life? Behind the life. I don't know if behind the life had a script supervisor on set or not. Yeah. But... Let's let's be clear. This was not a behind the music, the officially sanctioned VH1 series. This was behind the life. Which was shot in exactly the same way and had the exact same narrator <laughs> and, and aired on also VH1. Billy Joel was in it. Yes. Don was was in it yes don was as himself yes billy joel as As himself himself. yeah and And that was it right that that was it yeah yes but yeah pretty cool album cover i think for crush they're all pretty i mean they're very very cute boys they're just very very cute boys very leather mark obed's hair is too long for me for me it's the 80s let him go Let him go. (laughs) So then we go into Straight Jacket, Mm -hmm. the first solo album, which shows, this is almost prescient, it shows Gaines in a hospital room, but with two sexy nurses. These nurses are so, so sexy. I mean. So sexy. What is that one in the red wearing? Is that the fake leather? Pleather? They're both wearing pleather nurses uniforms, red and white pleather nurses. You kind of more like a first, like a Red Cross kind of situation than like actual nurses uniforms. This feels very Sunset Strip to me. Yes. This 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 aesthetic. But again, knowing what we know of Gaines life later, kind of startling that he has this as an album cover. I know, completely, yeah. Fornicopia, pretty racy cover, in my opinion, in a sort of clockwork orange hat yeah. and shadow over one eye. Gaines is just leaning on a lady's stomach, peering up between her breasts. You know, I had never noticed this before. When you said shadow over one eye, it's actually like completely blacked out. His right Whoa. eye is Whoa. completely blacked out. I yeah. just I just got deep in there too. You're right. So yeah, this woman's, I mean, she's lying on her back and her breasts are like two mountains that he's sort of peering over. And he looks very sad to be laying on this woman. But one thing I see in this picture is Tommy's ring on his finger. Yeah, absolutely. Ever, it's always there. And it's this is always his... there. I'm obsessed with it. The, uh, the, the darkness of this record, I think really kind of I don't know that it comes through with this like uh, pink kind of neon font. But it's like half of it is like very Copacabana and the other half is very, yeah, like you said, like but maybe a high school production of A Clockwork Orange. But maybe this is him withdrawing from that world, you know? He's so young. He's got such a baby face here. It's hard to it's hard for me to see such a young face and see jaded in it. You yeah, know? yeah. His next album, Apostle, features a very sepia-toned uh, doorway. Uh, no gains photos at all. This well, is, is this yeah. post-rec. He's not going to be able to put his face out there. And it's a, it's a door beckoning him. That's how I would interpret it. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. You know, come through here. And it's like light on the other side of the door. Which... So he's in sort of a darkened room, and it's like the door is to the outside, and you can see the sunlight flowing in. And it's honestly you, very moving. If you've had a you know that close to death experience, he probably saw the light. If your jaw has ever been ripped off your Eesh. face... Ugh, I can't imagine. You're going you're gonna to make an album called Apostle. Uh, and then Triangle. Pretty psychedelic. Like I love this cover. This is probably my favorite one because <laughs> it's really funny. It's really good. He's a kaleidoscope. He's a kaleidoscope. There's a bunch of noses on it and lips. It looks like you have know those things of when it's like an eight-year-old boy has a tumor removed, but it was all hair and teeth. <laughs> That's what this looks like. <laughs> Uh, That's what it looks like when someone someone has a tumor, but it's like one of those fancy tumors that has stem cells in it that grows hair. Um, this is everything you're saying right now is. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you some nightmare. pictures. I'll it's show you some pictures. Nightmare. I got some really good Google images. I'm going to show you some tumors. Trust me. <laughs> and then the greatest hits record cover, which you're all familiar with. Of uh, course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the beautiful gains on the cover again. There's a, a holographic version uh, you can pick up on eBay, limited edition. Very nice. Also, we found uh, on on the myspace page there's a like hologram chris gaines there was a fender, fender yeah. guitar was there a custom chris gaines guitar made at some point i don't know all i know is there's like eight pictures of a damn fender on yeah. the chris gaines myspace page. yeah none of my research and has, has said anything about that but it's a rabbit hole i'm definitely gonna <laughs> investigate for sure yeah i don't i think for today, that covers the life. Yeah. That covers what we needed to talk about today. Christian Gene Gaines. We got him from birth up to what we know. Up to what, if you wanted to know 
anything about Chris Gaines, I hope we helped you. Yeah. Because this is pretty much all there is. Yeah. If you've ever been curious, like, what's that guy's story? You literally know everything. There this is, is it now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll end it up there. You know, future episodes, probably going to tie facts from this episode and previous episodes together. I have a lot of just questions about the life of Chris Gaines from a storytelling perspective, I guess. Yeah. Do you want to get into those now? Uh, uh, I'll do it next time. Tune in next week. So if you have questions, yeah. like Ashley, I think, has questions. I have many questions. Tweet at us. That's about it. I mean, we don't have like a contact form on the side or anything. (laughs) But yeah, tweet at us. That's our preferred method of uh, being contacted. At Garth Gaines. SNL. SNL. Yeah, because again, remember, we want to tell you all about Chris Gaines, but we also want you to get Chris Gaines back Back on on Saturday Saturday Night Live. Back on Saturday Night Live. We talked about his November appearance in 1999. Thank you for including that, by the way. I really appreciate that. I like that it's canon in the life of Chris Gaines. It's his, canon. Saturday, his Saturday Night Live appearance. You know, yeah. I, I yeah, I think that's the only late night appearance that he made. Yes. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. I'm Michael Eads. I'm Ashley Spurgeon. We'll talk at you next time. Bye. The other thing that I'm having a really hard time tracking down, and if you feel like you can make this happen, I would love to see it, is the Right Now music video. So I can find the Lost in You music video, Mm -hmm. but there is a video for Right Now. It's featured in the Behind the Life of Chris Gaines episode. You can see little clips of it. Daily Motion is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us. (laughs) Daily Motion and (laughs) archive.org are your best friends when it comes to researching. (laughs) This Right Now music video, everything's an old real player or a flash player. Yeah. Not happening. (laughs) So if you've got a Betamax copy of that, send it our way. I will digitize it and put it up on archive.org and uh, (laughs) dailymotion.